Okay, uh, hello. Uh, uh, thanks again for staying on for, <laughs> for our next uh, talk today. Now, as I mentioned to you, uh, this is the second part in our lecture series. Um, in January, we had a talk by George Pattison on uh, uh, Dostoevsky. Uh, it was called uh, Dostoevsky and Putinism. And it really made sense to also have a talk on Tolstoy. And in this sense, I felt very fortunate, and I think we are all very fortunate, that uh, Tatiana is uh, spending this uh, academic year in Vienna. So she agreed to do this talk, which is connected to uh, her new book that she's working on now. She's already written a book on, uh, on Tolstoy. And so uh, this is, uh, her, her talk today will be based on her new project. I'd like to introduce her very briefly. You know, I'm a very talkative person, for those of you kn who know me, so the five-minute introduction is always a great challenge for me. So, Tatiana Gershkovich is the William Dietrich Associate Professor of Russian Studies at Carnegie Mellon University. She received her PhD from Harvard. The focus of her research is Russian Imperial and Early Soviet Literature. She looks especially at the relationship between literary forms and reading practices. She's published very widely in some very well-known and familiar to all of you journals, such as the Journal of the History of Ideas, the Slavic and East European Journal. Uh, she's also the author of uh, a book called Art in Doubt. Tolstoy, Nabokov, and the Problem of Other Minds, which was published in 2022. So, um, Tatiana, we are really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Clemena, um, for the invitation to participate in this wonderful series of lectures um, and for your introduction. When I'm teaching, I tend to shout, so <laughs> I'll try to modulate my voice given that I have a microphone, but if I start shouting, let me know. Um, so the theme of this lecture series, of course, is Russian philosophy and literature and art, and which philosophical ideas are often expressed in the age of Putin. And of course, this also means reading in the age of the war in Ukraine. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has compelled many of us to look more closely at the legacy of Russian imperialism, including in manifestations of culture. Over the past year, readers and critics have vehemently debated whether canonical Russian authors like Pushkin, Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy promoted an imperialist outlook that ultimately enabled the violence of the current regime. Different readers understand their ostensible complicity in different ways. Some, like Ukrainian author uh, Oksana Zabushko, holds these authors responsible for shaping the minds of Putin and his supporters. The road for bombs and tanks has always been paved by books, she argues, and we are now first-hand witnesses to how the fate of millions can be decided by our reading choices. Others argue for a sin of omission. The writer and journalist Jan Valetov contends that, quote, Russian culture is discredited not because it has produced savages and murderers through its fruits and efforts, but because it failed to make savages and murderers evenly even remotely resemble human beings, and now it answers for what it has not done, not for what it has done. To my mind, both arguments overestimate the reach and political potency of these literary works. But it is indisputable that successive regimes, imperial, Soviet, and post-Soviet, have deployed Pushkin, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and many others to promote their ideological and political objectives, including, of course, the suppression of other linguistic, cultural, and ethnic identities. But we should not presuppose that texts are all defenseless or equally defenseless before such instrumentalization. To assess the degree to which an author is responsible for the ideological purposes to which his texts are put, we need to look carefully at the texts themselves and the conditions of their creation and reception. We need to think about the thorny theoretical issue of authorial intent and examine the complicated dynamics of a text's afterlife. Such analysis requires a certain critical distance that, at the moment, many might find difficult to abide. Still, I believe that we need such critical distance 
to reckon with the question of literature's culpability, to move from polemics to a more nuanced understanding of the responsibility an author bears and does not bear for the ways he's read. In this talk, I'll look at the history of the culture battles between the Soviets and the Russian emigres in the wake of the Russian Revolution, specifically at their battle over Lev Tolstoy. In, I do so in order to try to understand how literary texts can and cannot be put to political uses, the factors that constrain their ideological malleability. In my previous work, I considered why and how authors may seek to constrain the way we read them. In my current project, a book titled Tolstoy Red and White, I examine how historical readers responded to such constraints. Were they bound by them? How, I want to know, did actual readers, Soviets, emigres, and the various warring factions within these groups, read Tolstoy in the tumultuous two decades after his death? How did they shape or fail to shape the meaning of his texts? Through a fine-grained analysis of reading practices at particular moments in history, 1919 Siberia, 1928 Leningrad, 1931 Paris, I want to understand what in practice puts limits on how a text could be construed from formal elements of the text itself to the hermeneutic exertions of competing readers. My focus today will be on three communities of readers of the 1920s, Soviet cultural pedagogues and their students, Russian emigres in Paris, and artists of the Soviet avant-garde. I will investigate their divergent reading practices by examining a peculiar yet popular practice in late imperial and early Soviet Russia, namely putting literary texts and their authors on trial. First, I'll spend some time looking at Soviet trials, which I'll then compare to a trial in the Russian immigration. Finally, I'll turn to an avant-garde twist on these agitational spectacles. I will discuss how and how well each group bent Tolstoy's text to their own ideological purposes and what resistance they encountered. Certain theories of reading pit an all-powerful reader against an infinitely malleable text. Such theories don't comport well with this history. Here, readers seem multiply circumscribed, first by the text themselves, whose formal and linguistic coherence confounded efforts to assimilate them, and second, by how other readers read. Those, like the Soviet avant-gardists, who wish not only to pin down the ideological content of Tolstoy's art, but to do so artistically, met still another constraint, the aesthetic demands of their own projects. So let me start with the Soviet readers. Vladimir Dmitrievich Nabokov, prominent emigre politician and father of the famous novelist, decried what he saw as the Bolsheviks' efforts to transform Tolstoy into their forerunner. In 1920, while marking the 10-year anniversary of the author's death, he observed, in Soviet Russia, they will try to prove by cherry-picked citations that the author of What People Live By and The Kingdom of God is Within You was the spiritual father of Bolshevism, communism, and the dictatorship of the proletariat. For this former member of the Constitutional Democratic Party, an opponent of the Bolshevik regime, the transformation was a ridiculous deformation. How could they claim kinship with an author famous for his Christianity, his pacifist doctrine of non-resistance to evil? The Soviet authorities didn't need to be reminded of their difficult task. In 1920 and again in 1928, before the centenary of Tolstoy's birth, they were all too aware of their interpretive predicament. Lunacharsky, the Commissar for Enlightenment, offered perhaps the most straightforward acknowledgement of their challenge in an article entitled We, Tolstoy, and Europe. Lunacharsky ventriloquized the European perspective on the Soviets' claim to Tolstoy. How can the USSR, marching under the banner of communism, in any way honor Tolstoy and consider him a kindred spirit? If you want to make this old preacher your ally, you will distort him, and probably many people, not only outside your country but within it, will sharply condemn this. A Tolstoy crudely trimmed to Bolshevik specifications might raise an outcry. Lunacharsky was keenly aware of this, and the anniversary events would therefore have to be carefully curated. The Commissariat for Enlightenment produced booklets, essay collections, and bibliographies for culture workers in libraries, schools, workers' clubs, and so-called reading huts in Soviet villages. Readers were to be guided carefully through Tolstoy's oeuvre, and Vladimir Lenin's essay, Lev Tolstoy is the Mirror of the Russian Revolution, offered a template for doing so. Lenin had famously argued that Tolstoy's artistic gaze allowed him to diagnose the disease of the imperial order, but his socio-historical position prevented him from recognizing the need for a revolutionary cure. 
Lanyon's directive to laud Tolstoy's art and disparage his philosophy was parroted in the commissariat materials and essays with titles like on the celebration of Tolstoy days in schools of socialist education and discussion of Tolstoy in reading huts. These celebration materials were meant, first of all, to promote literacy and educate the public about Tolstoy, but they were also meant to neutralize the quote-unquote harmful aspects of his art and thought without distorting him too much. To make the celebrations lively and not simply a series of ideological lectures, the manuals recommend involving participants in dramatizations of Tolstoy's work. They suggest in particular the short story Palikushka or the drama The Power of Darkness, Lestmi both of which represent the village under the heel of capitalism, as they put it. The commissariat deems other works not suitable for the village, and even the power of darkness struck education authorities as potentially problematic. The drama, for those who don't know, tells the story of Nikita, a weak-willed peasant corrupted by the desire for wealth and sex. He commits crimes that culminate in the murder of a child he conceived with his stepdaughter Akulina, uh, whom he had taken as his mistress. His wife, Anisia, and mother, Matriona, encourage him in the murder. His father, Akim, a simple, virtuous peasant, tries to bring Nikita back to God and honest labor, but fails. Tolstoy's drama certainly evinces the poverty, ignorance, and violence of peasant life in imperial Russia, a social critique the Soviets were eager to underscore. But it also stresses the moral corruption of the individual soul. Nikita, Anisia, and Matryona are all guilty because they place their own welfare above the imperative to serve God and love one's neighbor. This is the lesson that Nikita's father fails to teach him. Staging the power of darkness, one manual warns, will require considerable reworking, especially in the role of Akim. But peasant hut workers were not left to their own devices. The celebration manual gave detailed instructions on how to amend the play. You need to throw out all the discussion about, oh, we've forgotten God, all the discussion about sins, repentance. In addition to deleting Akim's religious exclamations, the manual advises cutting the last act in which Nikita repents before God. Instead, Nikita simply confesses his crime, and the constable declares we must draw up a report. Of course, it would be naive to think that one can excise Tolstoy's religious philosophical ideas about the roots of violence simply by cutting all mentions of God and replacing them, replacing Nikita's religious repentance with his arrest. As we know, and as the Enlightenment workers knew too, the ideational content of Tolstoy's story does not reside in any single character or set of phrases. It permeates the text, its imagery, linguistic texture, and narrative structure. Tolstoy's story takes as its model the biblical parable of the prodigal son. Nikita's selfish desires drive him deeper and deeper into spiritual degradation that ends with moral collapse and the crime of infanticide. The text, by way of Nikita's speech, describes his crime in vivid, even gruesome detail. After the murder, Nikita hears his child's wails and the crunching of bones. It's hard to imagine the play's spectators, particularly those attuned to the biblical intertext, would be satisfied by a legalistic conclusion to Nikita's story. Anything less than the cosmic pathos and moral reckoning of Tolstoy's original simply won't do. The patterning of the play, its form, diction, and imagery sharply constrain what can plausibly be done to its ending. It was not so easy to answer Lenin's call to honor the great artist while rejecting the landlord obsessed with Christ. Literary trials were a different, more creative, and arguably more successful way to meet the challenge. Historian Elizabeth Wood has shown that the practice of staging theatrical trials of literary characters, books, and authors preceded the Soviet's agitational initiatives. It has its roots in a tradition of philanthropic and educational institutions that use theater to educate the Russian public. These educators active in the last decades of the 19th century would perform not only and not even primarily uh, trials of literature, but also of practices and values. For example, Wood discusses the trial of vodka uh, staged in 1904 by the Alexander Nevsky Society for Sobriety. Silver Age poets and critics like Mikhail Bakhtin were active participants in literary trials. Among literary subjects, Tolstoy's and Dostoevsky's work proved especially fitting for trials thanks both to its popularity and to their, the pervasive um, theme of legal justice in their work. The literary trial was a promising method for emphasizing Tolstoy's social critique and excising his religious philosophical reflections. The Soviet um, celebration manuals encouraged its use. 
Not only could one easily cut any stretches of text that contained troublesome, religiously inflected language, but one could also head off any spiritual journeys that might take place. For example, in The Trial of the Power of Darkness, the character's crimes can be given in summary. The indictment should briefly summarize the crime contents of the play. Directing readers' attention to characterization and away from the play's narrative structure obscures Nikita's moral journey and Tolstoy's biblical intertext. Culture workers are instructed to help participants analyze the character of individual personages and draw parallels with the everyday life of the village today. The manual advises that in their statements before the court, Nikita, Anisia, and Matriona should recount their crimes, adding to Tolstoy's text where needed. What are these necessary additions? They are the characters' reflections on their own socioeconomic circumstances. The judge, for example, must ask Anisia a series of questions that elucidate her social origins and the influence of her environment and the church. Nikita's actions, in turn, are explained as a consequence of the harmful influence of Anisia, uh, the rich peasant, Kulachka Anisia. In other words, Tolstoy's characterization remains but is radically recontextualized. The outcome of the trial should be a guilty verdict pronounced not only upon autocracy and serfdom, but also on Christian morality. This interpretive strategy, with its focus on characterization, seems well-suited to Soviet aims. In reducing Tolstoy's narrative to paraphrase, readers are taught to see characters as social types and to recognize in Tolstoy's work presentiments of the forthcoming transformation of the Russian village. Yet even this form poses difficulties. The trial format compelled participants to perform a psychological maneuver more sophisticated than it seems. Since they were not given a script, but rather required to improvise as their assigned characters, taking on the role of one of Tolstoy's protagonists involved studying them in detail, seeking to understand their motivation, worldview, and manner of expression, and finally identifying with them sufficiently to embody them on stage. At the same time, participants knew the outcome of the trial. They knew whether or not their characters, or at least their characters' actions and beliefs, were to be condemned. The participants were thus put in the position of sympathizing with someone whose moral universe they found repugnant. In this light, their experience as readers seems to accord less with the Bolsheviks' ideological objectives than with Tolstoy's aesthetic ones. For Tolstoy, the value of art rests in large part on its capacity to cultivate empathy, or as he would put it, pity, even for those whose moral universe one finds alien or repugnant. In Anna Karenina, Konstantin Levin claims to fear fallen women the way some people fear spiders, yet comes to feel overwhelming pity for Anna when he sees a beautiful portrait of her. For Tolstoy, art requires both sympathy and judgment. That delicate balance is what makes it both important and frightening. One can identify with a character too much and fall prey to moral relativism. At the same time, art can allow us, like Nikita's father, to hate the sin but love the sinner. So in theory, the Soviet trial, by virtue of its form, the immersion in one's role that it required might have made participants more rather than less receptive to Tolstoy's religious and aesthetic ideas. Did it dis do so in practice? And this is one of the questions that came up in the earlier discussion, too, um, about how these things work in practice. Um, let me not anticipate myself here. So because these literary trials were encouraged primarily among provincial readers and in the Soviet context did not often involve the literary elite, it's not easy to find accounts of these performances. But as it happens, um, a scholar, Erika Stone Drennan, has conducted an excellent comprehensive study of Soviet and emigre literary trials and discovered and generously shared with me a record of one such trial which took place in a women's high school in the Siberian city of Novosibirsk. Notes on the trial were taken by Grigory Zhirnavkov, a Novosibirsk lawyer, Soviet politician, and literary activist. The students staged a trial of Count Dmitry Nikhludov, the protagonist of Tolstoy's 1899 novel, Resurrection. Along with The Power of Darkness, Resurrection was the work the Commissary of Enlightenment deemed most fitting for literary trials, in part because it thematizes legal justice. The story begins when Nikhludov finds himself a jury member in a trial of Katyusha Maslova. Katyusha is a prostitute falsely accused of poisoning a client. When Nikhludov sees the defendant, he realizes he had seduced and impregnated her in his youth. Disgraced, she was forced to give up the child and wound up in a brothel. 
Katusha is unjustly convicted and sent to a penal colony in Siberia. As in The Power of Darkness, the original sin here is egoism, evident most of all in Yehludov's sexual desire. The bulk of the novel's action is devoted to Nikhludov's spiritual journey to acknowledge and atone for the egoism that destroyed Katyusha's life. He grows aware of the injustice and violence of Russian society, gives his estate over to his peasants, and follows Katyusha to Siberia to pay for his sins. The celebration manual suggests the trial might begin as the novel does, with Katyusha Maslova on the defendant's bench. But midway through the proceedings, the court ought to take Count Nikhludov into custody. In essence, one manual explains, the trial is not of Maslova, but of Nikhludov, of his actions and morals. The trial in Novosibirsk was staged in 1919, uh, so years before these commissariat materials were published. Still, Zhernovkov's participation suggests an official sanction of this performance by the local authorities. Further, the trial does proceed broadly along the lines recommended by the commissariat. Zhernovskov's notes, seemingly written from the perspective of a judge, dispense with Maslova and declare the session of the literary court of Count Nikhludov is now open. The defendant is asked to give his name, occupation, and social position, suggesting again the emphasis on characterization in this type of exercise. After presumably giving Nikhludov a chance to describe himself, the court pronounces the charges against him and asks. So I'll show you the text as it appears in the manuscript. This is from the archive and then my transcription of it. So these are the charges. <clears throat> is Nikhludov guilty of committing the act with Maslova? And insofar as he did so, trying to make amends for his act with his 100 ruble handout and later accompanying Katusha Maslova to the penal colony and offering to marry her. Is Nikhludov guilty of subscribing to Henry George's theory of the unacceptability of land ownership while construing, uh, excuse me, while continuing to own land and enjoy all the benefits of the landowner's position? The trial participants, just as the commissariat manuals would later recommend, plan to judge Nikhludov's conduct and hypocrisy. At the trial, one manual argues, it's necessary with all decisiveness to fall upon the aristocratic egoism of Nikhludov, his desire to quote-unquote save himself at the expense of others. The Siberian students do indeed try Nikhludov's aristocratic egoism, though as the evening proceeds, there's a subtle shift in focus from the first word to the second, from aristocratic to egoism, from exploitation of class position to sins of the soul. So literary trial begins at 8.30 p.m., and you can see his blurry, it's blurry here, but you can see a timetable that he's written in the margin. Uh, it begins at 8.30 p.m. on December 1919 and lasts well into the night. The speech from the defense alone takes a full hour from 9 to 10 p.m. Other speeches follow. Then everyone present is invited to deliberate and deliver a verdict. They're reminded to reflect both on Nikhludov's private and public conduct. But now, after hours spent with Tolstoy's text and characters, the court veers away from Soviet-sanctioned socio-political questions and toward Tolstoyan moral queries. The very language of the document changes from bureaucratic to literary philosophical. And here's sort of where it is in the text, and I'll show you my transcription. The general question about the governing moral principle, living in concert with it, makes life free, and in violation means the death of the individual. Is Count Nikhludov guilty before the highest moral principle? The social causes of Nikhludov's crimes recede into the background as the violation of moral law comes to the fore. The second and last page of the trial script is inscribed at the top with the words, the voice of the moral law hums unceasingly. The court gives the final word to Nikhludov before offering what appears to be a summation of the trial's outcome. So here is the summation, my transcription. On the defendant's bench, we seated our conscience. Nikhludov, having accused himself, pronounced judgment upon himself. It is not people who are judges, but the inner moral law. On the defendant's bench is our very life before the moral principle. To rise to the heights of the moral principle and the call of fate, Nikhludov, he rose. He grew to reach this height and condemned himself. We must grow to Nikhludov's height and answer the call of fate as he did. The student trial begins just where the commissariat recommends. It ends somewhere strikingly different. Participants were supposed to acquit Maslova, but convict Nikhludov to rebuke his effort to save himself. 
Christian morality was to be debunked as a mechanism for enslaving the working people in order to fortify the power of the gentry and the bourgeoisie. It was to be displaced by the justice meted out by a new post-revolutionary community. Yet here, the highest judge isn't other people, but an inner moral law. Nikhludov is not only acquitted, but extolled for hearing within himself the call of fate. In the end, it's neither Maslova nor Nikhludov, but the conscience of the audience that winds up on trial. And I imagine that the outcome of the trial at the Siberian Girls High School would have pleased Tolstoy, who believed that social reforms could only follow from individual moral transformation. So from Georgist economics to the unceasing hum of the moral law, how did the trial go this way? Why did it not yield the outcome anticipated by the Soviet authorities? For one thing, the trial was staged soon after the revolution. Perhaps the eight years that had elapsed between this trial and those described in the celebration manuals altered the nature of the performances or the nature of the performers. The location of the performance may have also played a role. These Siberian school workers and their students were far from the organs of power, which may have left room for ideological deviation. But what seems clear from the trial notes is that the performer's aim at the outset really was to litigate social hypocrisy and economic crimes. Something about the staging of the trial, the embodiment of the novel's characters, the long immersion in its language, themes, altered the aims of the trial and its outcome. The text seems to have transformed its readers, no less than the readers transformed the text. So far, we've seen how Tolstoy's texts resisted their easy assimilation by the Soviets. Their structure, diction, skill at inspiring sympathy with their characters, all this constraint how they could be read. In turning to the emigres, we turn to a different kind of constraint, one imposed by competing communities of readers. Throughout the 1920s, the emigres watched closely as the Soviets commemorated Tolstoy. They ridiculed the interpretive gymnastics and cynical tributes of the Soviet authorities, contrasting them with their own supposedly sincere hymns to Tolstoy. In truth, of course, the emigre celebrations had their own objectives. For them, Tolstoy was a means not only of bringing cohesion to their community in exile, but of creating ties to their European neighbors. To this end, many emigres tended to diminish the national and socially critical aspects of Tolstoy's work and to stress his universal themes his status as a global figure. An article in the liberal emigre daily Rul, for example, noted that Tolstoy's 1920 memorial celebration in Berlin attracted not only members of the so-called Russian colony, but also German political and artistic elites. During the 100-year celebration of Tolstoy's birth eight years later, Rul similarly trumpeted events taking place in European cities, Hamburg, Ljubljana, Helsinki, Prague, and stressed the enthusiasm of the locals. Such meetings in memory of the great writer were so heartfelt and reverential, Rul reports, it is as though they honor the memory of a fellow countryman. In other words, as the Soviets tried to fashion a red Tolstoy to educate their newly literate masses, the emigres were busy building a white Tolstoy to win Western allies and secure their position in Europe. But Tolstoy was an easy ally for neither group in this cultural political skirmish. He had declared all members of the intelligentsia, from the most peace-loving constitutionalists to the most militant revolutionaries, to be parasites on the Russian peasants. He had denounced not only the Tsar's government, but also liberalizing institutions like the courts, which many emigre leaders valued and considered vital to Russia's gradual evolution into a quote-unquote proper Western society. The liberal emigre politician and jurist Yosef Gessen, who met Tolstoy, recalled the contrast between the author's cheerful indifference on artistic matters and his fury when the conversation turned to Russian courts, which Tolstoy had been researching for his novel Resurrection at the time of their conversation. As E.P. Panavaryov observes, many figures of the emigration spoke of the need to fight against Tolstoy's ideas, which in their opinion were not the least contributing factor to Russia's destruction. So they revered the artist who inspired nostalgia for a lost Russia, but feared the thinker who had hastened its demise. Not unlike the Soviets then, the emigres wished to decouple the genius artist from the misguided philosopher. And not unlike the Soviets, this decoupling proved difficult. In 1931, the Association of Russian Lawyers in France decided to replace their annual fundraising ball with a literary trial of Katyusha Maslova, Tolstoy's heroine in Resurrection. <laughs> 
Tolstoy was chosen undoubtedly thanks to his popularity with readers, and resurrection seemed fitting since, as I mentioned earlier, the pre-revolutionary Russian court plays a central role in the novel. The organizers intended to relitigate the case at the heart of Tolstoy's novel, and in doing so, to draw audiences, raise funds, and underscore the merit of the Russian court. This event, as they describe it to other association members, must have not only material significance, it must also be worthy of our social and professional importance and position. The trial of Katusha Maslova was advertised for weeks in advance with an emphasis on the involvement of well-respected legal professionals, in addition to prominent writers and journalists. The organizers counted on Tolstoy's resurrection to inspire nostalgia for the unrealized potential of the pre-revolutionary Russian courts. But the interpretive polemic that erupted so as soon as they announced their intentions demonstrated the difficulty of putting Tolstoy's novel to such use. The Daily Vazrajdenye published an angry letter to the editor from Alexander Krupiansky, writing on behalf of the Russian monarchists of France. The coming performance, the monarchist wrote, was a profanation of the Russian court distorted by Count uh, Alain Tolstoy in a biased and malicious manner. Other objections came from more liberal corners. The lawyer turned journalist Nikolai Chubashov published a piece in Vazrajdenya criticizing the choice of text. The trial of Katusha Maslova is a crude miscarriage of justice. Tolstoy openly mocks the court. That is exactly how the novel was received by the public. For the organizers, the novel was appealing for its renown and, central, and the central place it gave to the court. The critics demanded they read deeper. The cruel sequence of the novel's events, the caustic characterization, the withering language, all served to render the court as shambolic, inept, unjust, and crawling with vain functionaries. The trial of Katusha Maslova nevertheless took place on March 29, 1931. It proved to be a major cultural event, filling a thousand-person hall and earning reviews in several publications. The journal Illustrated Russia noted that court procedures were observed in all their detail. In the Soviet mock trials, everyone in the audience was asked to deliberate and vote on a verdict. Here, a select jury of prominent figures deliberated in private, offstage, and returned a verdict. Maslova was acquitted, eliciting resounding applause from the audience. Reviewers were inspired by the impassioned speeches of the prosecution and defense, which did, it seems, evoke a kind of wistfulness in the audience. As one reviewer put it, after all, there was, once upon a time, a court in Russia. Yet, the reviews also make clear that the anticipatory complaints had left their mark. The dispute could not be ignored. Reviewers dwelled on the contrast between the emigre trial and Tolstoy's original, noting where the trial hewed closely to the text, that is in the testimony of Katusha and the other defendants, and where it did not proceed as in Tolstoy, in the capable legal performance of the um, uh, legal professionals. The complaints of dissenting readers, monarchists, and liberals alike meant that Tolstoy's condemnation of the court could not help but pierce through the appealing picture painted by the association. One sympathetic reviewer declared that the performance meant to glorify the Russian court, not cast doubt upon it, but in the end it did both. Saboteurs in the gallery added a final twist to the trial by throwing bottles of foul-smelling liquid on stage. The culprits and their motives were unknown. Was this some defender of the dignity of the Russian court, one reviewer asked, or maybe an unflattering judge of the biased and malicious Count Tolstoy? Whatever the motive, I can't help but speculate that Tolstoy would not have minded the olfactory compliment to his intellectual critique, a hint of rot among these elegant, self-satisfied liberals. While the Soviets and the emigres fought over Tolstoy's legacy, many in the avant-garde wanted to renounce it altogether. Yet, their engagement with his work, even if only to mock it, could have equally unanticipated results, a recognition of affinity with the old realists they'd come to bury. Even the main Soviet line, celebrate the artist, denigrate the philosopher, was too generous for some leftist critics. Tolstoy, cynical, reactionary, and pernicious, should be rejected through and through. They disparaged the publishing house Gosses Dat that was bringing out Tolstoy's collected works with accompanying essays by Lenin and others. Gosses Dat was accused of advertising these publications in a shameless American way. Tolstoy's face was too big. Lenin's name was too small. Among those who refused to idealize 
Tolstoy was futurist Igor Terentiev, whom critic Robert Leach considered the movement's wildest and most daring theater director. In October 1928, Terentiev wrote in Novy Lef magazine, social infantilism, sometimes naive and organic, sometimes spiteful and contrived, represents the content of Tolstoy's genius. Terentiev's essay entitled A Family Historical Novel on Stage laid out his plans for a theater performance called War and Peace. Drawing on the novel and on Tolstoy's biography, he would create a montage to demonstrate the radically anti-revolutionary character of the author's work. Tolstoy's novel is an anti-historical work, Terentiev argued. It is an agitational work, Agitka and Politics. The director expected his production to be both profitable and politically useful. Terentiev engaged fellow writer-critic Vladimir Trenin to work on the biographical montage, and this section of the script was published in the same issue uh, of Novilev. The performance unfortunately never took place, but these two texts, Terentiev's sketch of the plan for the performance and Trenin's portion of the script, constitute a unique literary critical work that illuminates one avant-garde method for reckoning with Tolstoy. Though their scorn for Tolstoy exceeds that of the mainstream, we could say in um, contemporary language Soviets, and the emigres, the way in which they express it reveals an almost Tolstoyan attunement to matters of artistic communication. Trenin and Terentiev recognize that one cannot separate content from form, word from context. Their scathing yet oddly sensitive reading of Tolstoy does not attempt to isolate any aspect of his text, not characterization, not plot, not description, or intertext. Instead, they attend to Tolstoy's corpus as a whole, taking note of its patterns and parodically distilling it to its essence. Terentiev suggests a three-hour performance organized into three acts. Act one, everyone falls in love. Act two, everyone gets married. Act three, everyone dies. Trianian, for his part, takes an ingenious approach to the biographical montage. He constructs a text called A Day in Yasna Palyana, Tolstoy's home estate, of course, using quotations from the many accounts published in the preceding decades by members of Tolstoy's household. Trianian begins by stating his intention to expose the rotting everyday life at Yasna Palyana. He then explains his method. The speeches of all the characters are a combination of quotations from the following sources. He lists nine memoirs, including massive tomes by Tolstoy's secretaries, Valentin Bulgakov and Nikolai Gusev, as well as his, daughter, um, his doctor, Dushan Makavitsky. Both Soviets and emigres were publishing and exploiting such paratextual material to expand the cult of Tolstoy. Trenin aimed to ridicule this cult. For example, Trenin combines two citations from Gusev and Bulgakov to suggest Tolstoy's haughty attitude toward the many who wrote to him in his final years. Meditating on one letter writer's address to him as great brother, Tolstoy notes that people, quote, don't want to refer to me simply as merciful sire or dear Lev Nikolaevich, but always want to invent something extraordinary, and then they come up with all sorts of nonsense, end quote. In other words, Tolstoy, the preacher of brotherly love, would prefer to be called sire, not brother. Trenin's citational approach makes a claim to authenticity. He didn't invent any of these words, he suggests, but merely gathered them in one place to display the conservatism, absurdity, and general degradation of Tolstoy and his entourage. He likes to bring together quotes touching on Tolstoy's age or physical decline with evidence of his reactionary politics. For example, from Gusev's and Bulgakov's accounts, he stitches together the following scene. Tolstoy. Nine times out of 10, diseases are fabricated. We lived and lived, no one knew influenza, and now suddenly there's influenza. Dushan. Qatar has also recently appeared. Tolstoy. Yes, now even the peasants are saying Qatar. The other day, a woman told me about her husband. He's picked up a Qatar, and I'm sure that by this she means some kind of living creature. Eating. It's terribly disgusting when an old man smacks his lips like I do. It must be revolting to look at me. Mikhail Sergeyevich Suhotin. Old men are revolting in general. Tolstoy, no, I don't agree. It's good that you're an old man and I'm not. Mikhail Sergeyevich, you are very young, Lev Nikolaevich. This montage makes Tolstoy look like a vain and peevish old man, disdainful of the people. The portrait convinces because the words claim to be unaltered. Yet Trenin does cut, curate, and even invent his supposed citations. Suhotin did not really end by flattering Tolstoy's vanity, as he does in the script. This was Trenin's own addition. 
And even when he quotes faithfully, Daniel often obscures the original tone. For example, Tolstoy was speaking half in jest about the recent appearance of influenza. We know that because Gusev notes that one of Tolstoy's guests missed his irony as well. And Tolstoy is certainly joking when he claims to be younger than his son-in-law, Suhotin, who is 20 years his junior. In fact, throughout the script, Trenin eliminates laughter. To show Tolstoy laughing at himself and his ideas would undermine the portrait of a dogmatic reactionary. To show his family laughing together would undermine the production's stated theme of the decomposition of the family along with physical death. Of course, Trenin and Terentiev wanted laughter to be central to the performance, but only their own, not Tolstoy's. Terentiev was notorious for productions built around provocative, often scatological humor. In his plan for this production, he explained that, quote, the theater of illusion, theater of opium, moment by moment, interrupted by the theater of analysis, theater of the mind, will produce the most culturally top-notch reaction, laughter. But Terentiev and Trenin demanded a monopoly on laughter. It must be them and the audience laughing at Tolstoy, not with him. To laugh with Tolstoy would suggest common ground with him. Yet think how intimately they had to know Tolstoy and his art in order to produce such a play. Daniel alone read nine different accounts of Tolstoy's last decade. That's certainly more than many Tolstoy scholars. And he must have read them carefully enough to extract the choice bits. He immersed himself in these texts no less thoroughly and perhaps more so than those who read them in admiration. And it seems that this act of immersion, like that of the Siberian high school students, had the unintended effect of creating sympathy with what it meant to scorn. Terentiev's production wanted to underscore the radical break between Tolstoy's era and his own. Trenin was supposed to find evidence of this rupture. His script, however, establishes continuity. It's well known that Tolstoy had an ambivalent relationship with technological innovation. Yet the accounts of his later life attest to his enthusiastic use of new tools. The typewriter, the phonograph, the Shapirograph, the gramophone. Trenin's script seizes on this and heightens it. There are just a few moments in the script when Tolstoy is permitted to laugh along with the author and audience. Each concerns technology. The phonograph and the Shapirograph feature in the funniest if cruelest episodes. When a deranged visitor arrives, Tolstoy grabs the phonograph to record his ravings about everything from the apocalypse to electricity. Tolstoy's secretaries use a Shapirograph, a proto-copy machine, to send identical letters to any poet who dares send Tolstoy a sample of their work. Lev Nikolaevich has read your poetry and he finds it very bad. In general, he does not recommend that you pursue this endeavor. And this letter is no fabrication. Uh, Tolstoy did indeed dissuade anyone who would listen from becoming a poet. So this mixture of playfulness and cruelty, of reverence and derision for art, characterizes equally well the aesthetics of Tolstoy uh, as it does Terentiev and Trenin. Trenin's script stresses the role of media technology from its first pages. The list of characters includes the gramophone, which is given a name, pate. Tolstoy's secretary, meanwhile, remains anonymous. The mise-en-scene calls for a room with a poster on the door, Rimentone, writing desk, Shapirograph, typograph, phonograph, a gift from Edison, shoemaking and carpentry tools, shelves of books. Placing shoemaking and carpentry tools beside a typewriter, Daniel gestures toward the utilitarian strain of Tolstoy's late aesthetics, articulated famously in his treatise, What is Art? Tolstoy had insisted that art, like all forms of human activity, ought to be useful to others. He rejected what he saw as an arbitrary separation between high art and craft. And a scholar, Nina Guryanova, has shown this aspect of Tolstoy's aesthetics was crucially important for the avant-garde. Even amid his critique, Trenin's text nods to this contribution. He has Tolstoy's study resemble a futurist studio. Terentiev and Trenin claimed their intention was to debunk Tolstoy, to throw him overboard, so to speak, the ship of modernity. Yet in the end, these avant-garde artists can't help but acknowledge that Tolstoy helped build that ship. So to sum up, we might say that in all three cases, the Soviet, emigre, and avant-garde, the ideological exploitation of an artistic text is complicated by the artistic nature of the text. The Soviet uses of the power of darkness stumbled on the play's coherent structure, imagery, and diction, which made implausible the attempt to tell the same story while modulating it to a secular key. 
In the emigre trial of Katyusha Maslova, it was other readers complaining about the liberties taken who served to express the resistance of the source text. For the Soviet avant-gardists, intent on making compelling art of their own, their ideological agenda was transformed by their aesthetic commitments. What was intended to be a scathing indictment of Tolstoy turns into something funnier, stranger, and even grudgingly sympathetic. So by way of conclusion, I want to acknowledge that I've not pronounced a verdict on Tolstoy in the age of Putin, uh, and indeed that was not my intention. <laughs> I saw instead uh, to present a method of sorts for thinking about the responsibility an author bears for the ways that he's read. We're often told that art is always political, perhaps, but I would ask which art, which politics? The history I've counted reminds us that the relationship is complex but also amenable to empirical inquiry. Some artworks may be easily disburdened of their ideological content and put to this or that purpose. Other art, by virtue of its construction, less so. How does an artist construct art like that? And how does a reader react to it? Those in the broadest terms are the questions I ask in my work. And my hope is that these questions can help us navigate not only the cultural debates of the past, but also those of the present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. This was a really interesting talk with a lot of visual material to connect to <laughs> what we had before. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm sure that the others will have also some questions and comments. You know, I was just thinking about uh, your main concept of the literary trials. So basically, the way I understand it, because I, I, I didn't know anything about that before I met you and you told me about your research. So basically, the trials were about the characters of reenacting a trial on a Tolstoy character, which basically means that these trials presuppose a certain reading of Tolstoy, which on one level, it, it, it is a per perfectly legitimate reading, but I think probably for some people it would be not a very interesting reading if you are reading a novel in order to see what are the ethical lessons you can draw, what you can be taught, how you can teach your children to act like this or that character, good and evil and so on. Because I think that also, you know, what is the reason that people read Tolstoy is that every novel can be read on so many levels. But my point is that the literary trials seem to presuppose just one level of reading, this, this level of reading. Is that correct? Um, well, so the literary trials, they functioned in a lot of different ways. They had a very mm, sort of pronounced pedagogical function. So it wasn't just about indoctrinating, say, students about a certain kind of moral, or I wouldn't say moral, but probably more political orientation or moral political orientation, um, they also serve the pur purpose of teaching people who are newly literate to read. Uh, so what does it mean to analyze a character? Um, what does it mean to follow plot and so forth? How do you do these things? So that was part of what they were doing. And I think that is part of the reason that they didn't always function for that ideological purpose in the way that perhaps the people who had initiated these projects in intended them to function. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Any, uh, yes, please, Ivan. Thank you so much. It was, to me, fascinating. There are many aspects. I'm obviously not a specialist in, in the field. Uh, I have just one maybe question slash comment, um, which is going in the direction really of the constant reuse, right, mm -hmm. of anything which has been produced and uh, in a way, I would say completely, detachless from the person who produced it, being it a written or a visual data. Once you are doing it, this is not you anymore, but uh, it's the reader who activates it through his kind of meeting with the, with, with the text, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what is for me interesting in a way is to which extent your reading um, makes it more complex. Because I would say simply, we have a text which has been transformed by the history of Soviet propaganda, by the research of self of the Russian immigration, and by the, the, the play, the critical play of avant-garde. Mm -hmm. And you are actually in, indeed presupposing, if I get it well, uh, still an action of the already deceased Tolstoy on these three ways of being interpreted. Is this correct? So um, on the one side, 
to, I mean, it, it, does this suppose a sort of zeitgeist uh, going back and forward or, or not? Because it's really for me an interesting point. And, and then the second part is touching um, what you said at the beginning and you concluded with, right? This kind of uh, moralization to the past and uh, kind of, yeah, condemning possible authors for having built something. And you said it in a very elegant way. Uh, I would say that this is actually totally unacceptable. That you're really facing something which is close to, um, yet yeah, the expression of the most strong totalitarian regimes. When we are putting in the mouth figures of past, things they have not said, making them responsible for the future, this is really Maoistic as, as an attitude. So I, I was just guessing to which extent, as a literary person, as a scholar dealing with literature, we, you are still so kind in a way towards something which I feel much more dangerous and strong. I mean, <laughs> you said it kindly, but I would yes. say this is just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what I find so fascinating about reading Tolstoy in the Age of Putin <laughs> is the way that our conversations about authorial intention, theoretical conversations about authorial intention, which have been complicated, nuanced for half a century, have been flattened, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, in, in some ways, uh, some readers are holding authors directly responsible for, for certain words on the page that are open to interpretation, right? Um, and uh, from the other side, there's the sense of you can do anything to a text, right? You can mobilize it for any particular purpose. Um, and in fact, you know, people who study narrative, who study sort of literary theory, know that there's this vast middle ground um, that we've explored theoretically, but less so historically. So what I'd like to do in this project is think about, well, what are these dynamics exactly, right? Can we, under, can we think about authorial intent in connection with reception, right? In connection um, with sort of the, the in ideological intentions of particular readers and where and what factors can obstruct those intentions. Um, some of them I do think have to do with features of the text. So I would argue with, you know, strong Bartesian interpreta interpreters or something along those lines, right? And that was my first example of the power of darkness. You can't take this biblical story and completely retell it in a secular way. Or you can, but to a very unsatisfying sort of, uh, can create a very unsatisfying experience and a not very convincing experience, I would say, for the audience. And some of them have to do with um, reading community. So you're articulating your own stance as a reader in a way, right? That you find this kind of use unacceptable. Uh, and these readers in, um, in the uh, Paris trial, for example, uh, intervened, right? They found this use of the text unacceptable. So they wrote letters to the editor and so forth and, and said, you have to read deeper. You can't just use this text in this way. So I'm interested in teasing out kind of historically, uh, what are these factors that constrain interpretation. How does a text resist being instrumentalized, whether by way of its own features or by way of the life that it leads after its creation, right? So both in a sense. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sergei first, Misha second. Yeah. Thank you very much. I knew very little about that, so it's very, very illuminating. Um, but I'm reacting to this and to you, just a l last comment. Um, um, you, can, uh, you, you, you make me think, and sort of I'm wondering about the nature of the project as a whole. We cannot pretend that post-structuralism just went away right now, right? So in other words, like we know that you know, anytime you cite a text, it's decontextualized and it's a different text. So I wonder why, we, why you think you need to fight this battle that Derrida and company kind of one actually, right? So well, I would disagree about their victory. I guess. Really? I mean, that's part of the impetus of the project. Yes. So, um, who would be the audience that thinks that he lost? Well, I think that the field of narratology, for example, has been exploring you know this middle ground between a kind of post-structuralist uh, mm. view and you know people the, the authorial intent to, to to a strong sense of authorial intent. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think that a text is infinitely malleable, that it's decontextualized, and I hope that the historical examples bring that out, 
right? Um, you can't just do, in practice, in theory perhaps, in practice you can't just do what you want with a text. I, I don't think I'm convinced, but that's sort of a different story. Um, um, <laughs> so, but um, I thought it's, like... I I'll, mean, it's fair. Right, yeah. Um, but um, when I, again, like when I was listening to you, I thought like, well, it's interesting. So what happens if you flip the lens, right? So instead of sort of for grounding Tolstoy, which seems to be kind of your main figure and like you want to keep him present throughout, right? Mm -hmm. What if you approach Tolstoy as a vehicle for something else? Namely, sort of your two first examples are sort of perfect, right? So what we have is the emergence of a particular form of entertainment. The immersive, it's basically sort of a prequel to Dao. A prequel to what? Dao. Do you know mm -hmm. the Dao yeah, project? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you have to embo embody it, like sort of like you have, it's a completely different aesthetics, right? Mm -hmm. So nothing distant. You have to be there, you have to be imagine. you have to be imagining yourself as this or that kind of character. But then there is this very sharp, very abrupt sort of moment of defamiliarization, sort of Bechtian, mm -hmm. right? And that's what you show. It's really interesting because nobody writes about that. Like mm -hmm. we all think that sort of, you know, this immersive theater emerged in the last, well, like 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. Not true. Right. Right? Yeah. Mysterious, what not, like sort of like, but what you add to this is this kind of moment of familiarization, which is crucial kind of to, yeah. to destroy the illusion. That would be immensely interesting, really, mm -hmm. if you show that. But for that, like, sort of, like, you need to push Tolstoy. Push Tolstoy to the back. <laughs> and then with the last one, sort of, I thought, like, mm -hmm. well, it sort of it didn't quite gel to me, like, sort of, mm -hmm. like, somewhat separate. But there is a different parallel. I don't know if you watched the film by um, Ogarov, um, um, Bratty Chair. Mm. Exactly the same method, right? mm. except that sort of like he claims that he is doing documentary and prose, docu 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 drama rather, right? Where he uh, m kind of enmeshed um, diaries of Chekhov, letters of Chekhov with his kind of fiction, and then produced this film where sort of it's all about brothers, right? So like how sort of they're kind of like a story in the, in the state um, and how they sort of live and quarrel and whatnot, right? Claiming, so I wonder, he, was, uh, he died recently, but sort of I went when he presented it, and he was claiming. This is a document. There is nothing uh, invented in the film. Sure, but like sort of like there are genre differences and so on and so forth. And you show a similar kind of thing, right? So right. But again, it has a highly sort of contemporary component, right? So like yes, but that's what I'm saying. But for that kind of, if you if you focus on genres mm -hmm. and models of appropriating the text, then the intent and sort of the limits of the te text would become much less relevant, right? right. Instead, sort of like you would see how, you know, like new forms that are still relevant, you know, could, could, could be elucidated and sort of brought out and so, mm -hmm. I don't know. It, yeah, no, that's really, that's really interesting. I mean, so um, I'm at the beginning stages of this project, so it could take a number of different directions, and I'm very interested in genre, actually, and a number of other things. Um, so perhaps that came through in kind of my approach. Um, yeah, and to me, this, this um, documentary approach it reminded me actually of the sleeve, right? The sort of hacking, uh, you know, claim to authenticity. I'm just giving you these documents. Um, so it's, you know, it's old. <laughs> it's an old method. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. So, so actually, I, I like your approach a lot because as someone coming um, from history and sociology rather than uh, literary theory, which I know very little about, um, I'm, I'm always... Um, very frustrated when people start saying that you can do anything with anything, <laughs> with anything with everything, right? Yes. Um, because when, you know, just like you said, when you study actual empirical cases, usually that's not the case. But um, building on perhaps the last bit of your reply to Ivan, I'm curious about how you would phrase your alternative approach in more general terms. So um, what is it exactly in the text that constrains its own malleability? Is it, for example, literary quality? Mm -hmm. So, would the same principle apply to text by less talented authors, right? So, yeah. Sergei just said, you want to foreground Tolstoy, could you do the same thing with, I don't know, Vladimir Korolenko, and then, you know, going down the kind of literary, the steps of the literary canon? Where, where does it end? I mean, is there a, a genre of text? Is there a quality of text that does lend itself to kind of infinite interpretations? Because maybe it's so dumb, mm -hmm. right? so you, kind of, you strike it and it doesn't, there's no echo coming back, so you can do, you can do anything with it. Yeah. Um, or, or is it something that's completely different from literary quality? So what is it exactly, kind of, not talking about Tolstoy in particular, but in general, and in, in you called it a narratological approach. So that's the first point. The second, uh, or the first question, the second question is, I'm really interested in this, these trials as, as a practice. Um, and of course, it, it raises the interesting question of what people use trials for other than narrow legal purposes, right? Mm 
And of course, and you mentioned this very briefly, there are echoes of the judicial reforms associated with Alexander II, but which continued into the 1905 revolution, etc., um, which must have created the kind of context where people were becoming more familiar with different kinds of trials and different purposes um, to which trials can be put. But also going back into history, you know, we've had trials for all sorts of things, you know, trials of non-human animals, etc. So I'm wondering what the specific, I mean, you just mentioned the didactic purposes and the sort of educational, but where do you see the literary trial in the entire spectrum of kind of trials as uh, a social practice Mm -hmm. going beyond the purely, you know, narrow legal purposes, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so to answer the second question first, I think um, I've been focused on the pedagogical. To me, that is sort of the low-hanging fruit here. Um, it's very explicit in the Soviet context, especially. In the emigre context, it's a little bit murkier. They actually had a lot of disdain for this type of practice, literary practice. Ivan Bunin, for example, refused to participate in this trial of Katyusha Maslova. Uh, uh, in part because they saw it as a Soviet practice. It had become very popular. Um, it was considered sort of provincial. There was a provincial stink about it, as some, some said, but it was also quite popular. So the reason that they did it anyway was because it raised funds for various organizations. Nabokov participated in one such trial, and he wrote to his wife Vera, I find this repugnant, but I'll do it for the money, kind of that sort of sentiment. Um, so it served, you know, this economical purpose. There was this pedagogical purpose. Um, I'll have to think... Uh, more about that question, especially for trials where authors participated. So uh, Babel, for example, participated in his own trial. He was put on trial for defaming the army of all <laughs> charges, um, and he spoke in his own defense, and he spoke so eloquently, apparently, that he was acquitted. Um, and so he was an enthusiastic participant in this kind of endeavor. Um, so yes, so thank you for that, for that prompt, and I'll have to think sort of deeper about the purpose, the social purpose of it. Um, with regards to your first comment and question, um, I, maybe this is me being elitist, but I do think that some texts are harder to instrumentalize than others. Um, and I think some authors, Tolstoy, to my mind, uh, very consciously pursued the project of um, shaping his works in such a way that they couldn't be misinterpreted. So in my first book, I argue for this being a sort of lifelong quest of Tolstoy's. How do I create such a work that is so transparent, right, that it can't be misinterpreted? Um, I see, that, see this as sort of part of the reason why he drives toward greater and greater asceticism in his late uh, work. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so that is a kind of working hypothesis of the project that some texts are easier uh, to to use to instrumentalize for ideological purposes than others. Based on, I would I would say um, that is the open question for. In part, I would say structures, literary structures, certain uh, kinds of ways of writing and shaping a text, um, and then the reception. I don't know. The reception is sort of something that I'll have to to think through. Yeah. Can yeah. I just say something, uh, Ivan? Just just two sentences, because I think it relates to what you're talking about here. Because there seems to be an implication that a text which is somehow of a lower quality is easier to instrumentalize than a text which is somehow of a higher quality. I think it might be exactly the opposite. It that if be. you have a text that can be read on many, many levels because it's so complex, it's much easier to instrumentalize because you just focus on one of the levels, you ignore the others, and then it's very easy to manipulate and present <laughs> this text in a different way. Uh, now, whether probably Tolstoy, as you say, wanted to make his text transparent, but I don't think he did that because they're such complex texts, and they're so easy to instrumentalize for that very reason mm -hmm. because there's so many layers of uh, meaning there. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was thinking because you started with these sort of uh, quotes about the reception of Tolstoy nowadays in the context of uh, what's going on with the war in Ukraine and so on. And you know, uh, 
I think that in a way these are trials of authors. So you're talking about trials of literary characters. But nowadays you sort of have this almost it's like a genre of writing because there's been so many of these publications where you literally see people putting the author on trial. You know, like whether it's Do Tolstoy or Dostoevsky and uh, so on. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah. sorry, Ivan, please. Oh no, I, I, I was going in the same direction. Actually, it would be marvelous to imagine a world in which the quality of the text or the literary attributes of it are making it less instrumentalized. But I would say that one of the m top of human culture, at least the period I'm working on, is that we are able to transform and instrumentalize everything from a picture to any sentence to any complex text. And uh, I, I, it would be magic to have a formula which is making a text, as you said, totally transparent, but honestly, I mean, you, you have shown it. I mean, it's enough to cut three words from a sentence, uh, which is a small manipulation of saying everything. And we, I mean, in visual words, this is just so explicit. You cut mm -hmm. one part of something and a master is becoming something completely different than it's ever been. So I don't know if this is, I mean, not a utopia. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a kind of aspiration of Tolstoy's and I don't, don't suggest that he ever achieves it for example. Um, the utopia. But, well, but you see, you know, I gave you some historical examples where, yes, of course you can use these texts for a particular purpose, but maybe you won't achieve everything that you set out to achieve, right? There are certain ways in which the, t the text pushes back or, or there are other readers push back. Um, so it's all, you know, I am thinking about the gray area. Yes, it's conceivable sort of in theory, but in practice it's more limited. So, and I'm interested in, the, in that sort of... Um, how a text actually lives in the world. How does it actually work in practice to try to instrumentalize something? Yeah. yeah. The, the logic question is, uh, yeah. what's at stake in maintaining that the original text had a certain integrity? I mean, we know that. I think what's at stake is uh, asserting that writing, in this case, is still a communicative act. I mean, I think where the writer has an intention. And Great. Yeah. But we know that. So do you need to prove that? Well, mm, do yes, we know so that? He wrote it because he wanted to say something clearly. In this yeah. particular shape, in this particular form, fine. So that was the message, um, you know, totally determined by this particular period, his intention, I don't know what he ate this morning and what not, right? Yeah, but, but his intention is also not all powerful. So I guess, I mean, that's how the, we end up having these conversations. One side you just presented saying, well, you can instrumentalize a text for any reason. It could say anything. And you're just saying, well, Tolstoy had a particular thing that he wanted to say, and he did say it. I'm saying, well, no, actually, like the dynamics of how, <laughs> how those two things interact are interesting, right? So Tolstoy had a particular intention that is then deformed by the way that his texts live. Of course it is, right? On the other hand, it's not deformed into any and all shapes. There's a particular constellation of shapes that's possible. And so that is what I'm interested in. And the way that it relates to the contemporary question is now, or, you know, there's a debate. Are these authors culpable, right? Can we hold them accountable for this and that? Maybe you can dismiss that debate, but if you are to take it seriously, then I propose then you have to think through that constellation of meanings that's made possible. And so that's what I'm attempting to do. Does that make sense? That's the stakes for me, I guess, yeah. No, this is wonderful because, you know, now I have so much material to think through as right. I continue. Because basically yeah. what you, you're kind of highlighting is that any rereading of the already kind of created text could have different functions, or different purposes. And depending on the functions and purposes, you either, you know, faithful to the text or like you're completely, you know, voluntaristic and you do whatever you want to do, right? And so, right, but you need to have this kind of body of words with which you could work, right? So right. that's given. You could decompose them, deconstruct them in each and every way, but sort of like they have to come first, right? So focus on the functioning differentiation then of um, a more precise differentiation of these functions would be helpful, like if that's what right. you're yes. saying. Because yeah. depending on the intention then of the reader, the text highlights or foregrounds or affords sort of different interpretive strategies. That I understand, but sort of you don't go right. really in this direction. And the functions are not unlimited as part of, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Go, go ahead. Just a very brief reaction to this discussion from my disciplinary perspective. The, in, in sociology, there's this notion of investment into form, mm -hmm. um, where 
it's, I mean, when someone says you can, you can take something and do anything with it, um, the suggestion sometimes appears to be that you can do it immediately. It's like alchemy. Um, my kind of middle ground position as a sociologist or as, you know, when I'm wearing my sociologist hat would be to say you, maybe you can, but it requires some investment, mm -hmm. uh, which, which, you know, you, you mentioned that you study these things historically, which takes time, which takes effort, and which means that you need to, um, in a sense, methodically work against forms that have already been established as conventional. Mm -hmm. right? So maybe that's a possible way to express the compromise solution. That's very helpful. That Thank you. About. Yep. Mm -hmm. That makes good sense. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, com really short comment because you were saying speaking about this idea. Do we need to prove that a literary act, or I would say an artistic act, however we can call it, is done to communicate, right? You say it in this way, basically, as something proven. And I believe that this was proven, but it's not anymore, for many reasons. And one, no, I mean, the pro problem is that um, I, I can see it from the production of images, which is something pretty interesting, because we are all assisting to this production of images, which is now touching a limit of, uh, impossibility just to even imagine to see them, right? And in front of this situation, um, now the one of the most interesting theoretical framework is the one of Beltingian, right? That uh, these images are actually an act of uh, preservation in a way of our lives. So we are producing images to not die. That is becoming kind of really superbly absurd way of doing something in an almost historic way without even obviously rationalizing it at all. Now, uh, I believe that this kind of question are readdressed by the overproduction of everything in which we are right now. Overproduction of images, overproduction of texts, uh, that actually what have been for centuries means of communication are not anymore. And this is mm. pushing us back to the very question, what is the goal? And uh, for, for visual, uh, visual data, I'm more and more convinced that we are really going in a part of the brain where communication is not <laughs> the, the, the main issue anymore, mm. which is funny. Yeah. That's interesting. And I'm finished. I don't want to monopolize. But, uh, but, but what you're saying is basically, but you are 101, so like simulacrum, so like the signif signifier de devoid of any signified. So like again, like it's post-structuralism kind of basics. But um, They didn't win, right? You're uh, saying that... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, okay. Going back to wh what Misha said, uh, it's interesting, sort of, um, I, I didn't think about that, I should have. Um, but, um, you know, this orientation on the form, like if you read, like, sort of formalists of, um, from the 20s, so you get the orientation on the form, to, towards the form, ustanovka uh, na, na formu, right, that comes together with ustanovka um, na prium. Right, so and that's where formalists are uh, usually kind of, you know, confined to, right? But then, of course, like later on, it ca uh, there is ustanovka na material. Mm -hmm. And with material, the internal, the external form becomes completely relevant, right? So you you treat Tolstoy as a vocabulary or repository or whatever, like sort of like you know, um, um, uh, repertoire, right, of some symbolic means, and that's it. So in that sense, like it become it, it enables pretty much what training does, right? So like, well, yeah, you can sort of you know slice it in each and every way. But I think like the in, in interrelation among these three orientations through установки might be interesting for you, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's uh, very helpful. Thank you very much. I think that this was a great discussion, which was uh, a, a testimony to the fact that it's often so interesting when someone presents uh, a project which is work in progress rather than something you've already done. And whatever people say is a bit meaningless because <laughs> it's already published and that's it. And I, th I also think that you have an extremely sort of interesting approach. You, you have great material. And thank you very much for participating, Tatiana. This was great. Thanks very much for your contributions throughout the, the lecture series. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Uh, we have to finish sort of about now. And we are meeting <laughs> uh, outside uh, at the reception with the speakers. Yeah. Uh, well.